Ah, the Super Nintendo. Originally launched in Japan in 1990 and in the West in 1991, it is considered by many to be a major part of a golden age of gaming. The Super Nintendo spawned a countless number of games that would go on to become some of the major franchises that still exist today. The Super Nintendo took everything that the original NES had done and improved upon it. From superior graphics, sound, music, and gameplay, the Super NES is legendary for having some of the greatest and most innovative video games of all time developed for it. I originally played it sometime around 1993 or 94 at my cousin's house and was hooked immediately. Finally, I received one for Christmas about a year or so later, and have never looked back since. On this channel, I have played many Super NES games, done several videos talking about the console, and even showed off my rather modest Super Nintendo collection. The Super Nintendo is undoubtedly my favorite console of all time. I don't shut up about it, even 25 or so years later. That being said, I thought that it was finally time for me to make a definitive list on what are, in my mind, the top 20 greatest Super Nintendo games of all time. Please note that this is my personal opinion, and is not meant to be a list of what I think are objectively the best games, but what my personal preferences are. Number 20, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles 4, Turtles in Time. Cowabunga, dudes! Developed by Konami and based off of the original Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles animated series, Turtles in Time was originally released in 1991 as an arcade beat-em-up. It was ported exclusively to the Super Nintendo in 1992, and although several animations, levels, and moves were changed from the arcade version, the core game was still retained. The action is fun and frantic, especially with a friend, like James, and traversing through time through colorful worlds, fighting an array of enemies including Shredder himself. Turtles in Time is undoubtedly the greatest beat-em-up game on the Super NES, and even considered by many to be the greatest beat-em-up of all time. Number 19, Donkey Kong Country 3, Dixie's Double Trouble. The third and final entry of the original Donkey Kong Country series may be the weakest, but is by no means a bad game. Donkey Kong Country 3 expands upon the series by adding a plethora of different creative, although admittedly difficult, <coughs> lightning lookout <coughs> levels, <laughs> new baddies, animal buddies, and a more expansive and interactive world map. The graphics also are given a nice boost, and although I enjoy the aesthetic of Diddy's Conquest more with its darker tone, Donkey Kong Country 3 incorporates a lot of bright colors and more vivid worlds than its two predecessors. Its soundtrack is no slouch either, and fits perfectly with the world. Despite being released in 1996 as one of the very last first-party games developed for the system, it truly impresses and remains one of the best entries of the entire series. Number 18, Killer Instinct. This was the very first game that actually came with my original Super Nintendo. Developed by Rare, originally for the arcade and released exclusively for the Super NES in 1995, Killer Instinct is, in my mind, the greatest fighting game for the Super NES. Move over, Street Fighter 2. Although games like Mortal Kombat and the aforementioned Street Fighter 2 had already been released for the console, Killer Instinct still managed to keep it fresh and remains one of the most unique fighting games of all time. Its darker tone, unique and colorful cast of characters, as well as its absolutely phenomenal soundtrack, makes it really stand out amongst other fighting games of that time period. Killer Instinct is beastly two-player fighting action at its best, and remains one of my favorites to this day. Number 17, Tetris Attack. There are many puzzle games on the Super Nintendo, but in my mind Tetris Attack is undoubtedly the best puzzle game for the Super NES. Originally called Panel Dupont in Japan, it was developed by Intelligent Systems and released in the West as Tetris Attack in 1995. The original Japanese version featured anime-style fairy characters that were replaced by characters from Yoshi's Island for the Western release, although the core game re remained the same. Tetris Attack is my personal favorite puzzle game of all time. The gameplay is frantic, fun, and incredibly addicting, and the action is even better with a second player. I also personally truly appreciate the Yoshi aesthetic and find the unique cast of characters delightful, as well as the general aesthetic of the game being bright, colorful, and pleasing with an amazing soundtrack. Number 16, Illusion of Gaia. Developed by Enix and released in the West in 1994, Illusion of Gaia is, in my opinion, the greatest Enix RPG, as well as the best action RPG for the Super NES. Hey, I had to put an Enix title in here. While for many, Secret of Mana would easily take this title, to me, Illusion of Gaia is just more fun, the story more engaging, and the action and gameplay much more satisfying. You play as Will, a young teenager with psychic powers who embarks on a journey to the Tower of Babel in order to stop a comet. He journeys across several real-world locations, such as the Incan Ruins, Egyptian Pyramids, and Great Wall of China, 
and Will utilizes a dark form called Freedan, and later an energy form called Shadow that both give him different abilities. Illusion of Gaia is a truly unique experience that is fun, engaging, and quite moving as the story progresses. I'm also going to give a much needed honorable mention to Secret of Mana here. While definitely one of the most unique and beloved action RPGs of all time, I feel as though I haven't played enough of it to warrant its inclusion on this list. I personally played about half of it, and while I have enjoyed the game thoroughly, I didn't think it was appropriate for me to include it given my lack of exposure to it compared to other titles on this list, so sorry you Secret of Mana fans. Number 15, Kirby Superstar. Released in 1996, Kirby Superstar isn't just the best Kirby game on the Super NES, it may very well be the greatest Kirby game of all time. The last Kirby game developed by series creator Masahiro Sakurai of HAL Laboratory, Kirby Superstar is a fun batch of addicting and diverse games, including seven main adventure games and two mini-games, all crammed into one cartridge. The graphics are bright and colorful, and the action is fast-paced and fun. The ability to use Kirby's copy ability to utilize an array of different moves makes for some very diverse gameplay, but even more interesting is having a second player join as any number of enemies that Kirby can swallow, giving the player the opportunity to play as many different characters within one game. Kirby Superstar is one of the most exciting platformers for the console, and is an easy game to pick up, back up and play anytime. Number 14, Final Fantasy VI. Many people consider this to be the very best RPG for the Super NES. While there are a number of other RPGs that I personally prefer over Final Fantasy VI, there is no doubt that it really is one of the greatest RPGs for the Super NES, and indeed one of the greatest RPGs of all time. Released in 1994 and developed by Squaresoft, Final Fantasy VI is a huge game set in a sort of medieval, steampunkish, early industrial world, ruled by a totalitarian empire. Starring a huge cast of characters from Terra, the Esper, to Locke, the Thief, and even a Moogle named Mog, our heroes journey on a quest to bring down the empire and try to stop Kefka, a malevolent, uh, clown jester thing? <laughs> Either way, he's one of the strangest and most vicious villains in gaming. The turn-based system is an improvement upon previous games in the series, and the graphics and music also receive a more well-polished upgrade. Final Fantasy VI to me is one of the greatest Final Fantasies of all time, and an all-time classic that is essential for any Super NES library. Number 13, Super Castlevania IV. Chilling to the bone, and having some of the best atmosphere of any game on the Super NES, Super Castlevania IV is a landmark entry in Konami's Castlevania franchise. Released in 1991 as a sort of reimagining of the first Castlevania on the NES, Super Castlevania IV improves upon the original in every way. Simon Belmont looks better than ever, and the graphics, atmosphere, and the absolutely stellar soundtrack make for a truly haunting and immersive experience. The gameplay is a bit more polished than previous entries, with Simon being able to control his whip in a variety of directions, rather than just straightforward. The whip can even be used defensively, to grapple onto things, or even be swung right in front of him. The gameplay is a little less brutal than previous games, but still very challenging, making for a less frustrating but fun experience. Super Castlevania IV is in my mind the greatest game of the franchise, and one of the best platformers of the SNES. Number 12, Donkey Kong Country. When Donkey Kong Country was first released, it's safe to say that people went bananas over it. <laughs> okay, okay, <laughs> it's Donkey Kong Country, how can I not put this in here? Released in 1994 and developed by Rareware after half of the company's acquisition by Nintendo, Donkey Kong Country was a massive success and a landmark release for the Super NES. The pre-rendered 3D graphics were groundbreaking for the time, and really pushed the boundaries of the Super Nintendo's hardware capabilities. Aside from that, it's a great game and an awesome reboot of the original Donkey Kong games. The game launched the Donkey Kong Country series as one of the most popular and successful Nintendo franchises. The game is 2D platforming at its finest, as the player takes hold of Donkey Kong and his nephew Diddy to stop King K. Rule and his army of Kremlins to retrieve Donkey Kong's stolen banana horde. The graphics are crisp and vibrant, the levels are varied and unique, and the music is absolutely fantastic. Donkey Kong Country is an absolute must-have for any Super NES fan, and one of the greatest platformers of all time. Number 11, Final Fantasy IV. Although many would say that Final Fantasy VI is the superior Super NES Final Fantasy, my vote will always go to Final Fantasy IV. Released in 1991 by Square as one of the first games for the console, Final Fantasy IV was the first Final Fantasy to flesh out its characters and world in a really intriguing way in my opinion. It was a landmark title for the series and for RPGs in general at the time. Final Fantasy IV's turn-based system, strong story, and absolutely stellar soundtrack by Nobuo Uematsu really make it stand out, 
and his cast of characters are both varied and surprisingly relatable. From Cecil's internal struggle, to Rydia's hardships in growing up, and Edward's uh, spoony bardness, <laughs> the game's cast is very memorable, and the relationships between them intricate. The story sees Cecil's party travel throughout all corners of the world in search of the Four Crystals. The adventure takes them up mountains, underground, and even to the moon. Final Fantasy IV was my first Final Fantasy game, and one of the greatest RPGs for the console. It's also a wonderful place for newcomers to the series to start their journey into the world of Final Fantasy. Number 10, Super Mario Kart. No console is complete without at least one stellar racing game, and undoubtedly the best racing game for the Super NES is none other than Super Mario Kart. Released in 1992 as the very first entry of the series, Super Mario Kart was groundbreaking for the time. Featuring 8 playable characters, 20 different tracks, and 3 different modes, Super Mario Kart is jam-packed full of fun, 2-player racing action, and is a great game to pick up and play with loads of replayability. The tracks are all varied locations based off of Super Mario World, including the Donut Plains, Chocolate Island, and even Bowser's Castle. The game's graphics are really vibrant and colorful, and the music is an absolutely perfect fit for the fast-paced action. Whether it's alone or with a friend, Super Mario Kart is incredibly fun and addicting, and a game that I go back to quite often, actually. In my view, Super Mario Kart has, and always shall be, the greatest Mario Kart of the series. Number 9, The Legend of Zelda, A Link to the Past. Released in 1992, The Legend of Zelda A Link to the Past is undoubtedly one of the greatest action-adventure games of all time. Throwing out the side-scrolling formula of Zelda 2, A Link to the Past harkens back to the original top-down perspective of the first Zelda for NES. Hyrule is bigger and more vibrant than ever in all of its 16-bit glory, and the mechanics of the game are greatly improved upon from the original. A Link to the Past still looks absolutely gorgeous, and the puzzle solving of the many dungeons coupled with the genuinely fun exploration of both the overworld and the dark world make the game feel much bigger and more immersive than its predecessors. Naturally you play as Link, who after rescuing Zelda must collect three magic pendants and face Aghanim, I got that on the second try, <laughs> a dark wizard. After retrieving the Master Sword, Link defeats Aghanim, but not before the wizard sends Link to the Dark World. Link then embarks on a quest to save the Seven Sages to defeat Ganon, and after touching the Triforce, restores both Hyrule and the Dark World to their former states. The Legend of Zelda A Link to the Past is an absolutely fantastic game, and my personal favorite Zelda game of all time. Number 8, Donkey Kong Country 2, Diddy's Conquest. Okay, no more monkeying around. While the first Donkey Kong Country was a groundbreaking game for its time, it's Donkey Kong Country 2, Diddy's Conquest, that I truly go ape over. <laughs> Released in 1995 as a follow-up to the original, Donkey Kong Country 2 improves upon its predecessor in every way. The gameplay is more challenging than the first, but also not impossibly difficult, giving the player a feeling of accomplishment when proceeding to the next world. The game stylistically features a predominant pirate theme, as well as a much darker tone and atmosphere than any of the other entries in the series. You play as Diddy Kong and Dixie in her first appearance on a quest to save Donkey Kong from the evil Captain K rule. The level design is some of the absolute best in the series, incorporating some very unique and new ideas, and the game is much larger than its predecessor, featuring 52 levels in total. There are also a lot of collectibles to be found in the game and secret levels to be unlocked that make the game highly replayable. However, by far the greatest aspect of the game is the absolutely phenomenal soundtrack by David Wise. The music fits the atmosphere of the game absolutely perfectly, and to this day remains one of, if not the greatest soundtracks for the Super Nintendo in my opinion. Donkey Kong Country 2 was an absolute staple of my childhood, and in my mind one of the very best platformers the Super Nintendo has to offer. Number 7, Super Mario World 2, Yoshi's Island. An overweight man in a restaurant, stuffing himself until he literally explodes. That was my first exposure to Super Mario World 2 Yoshi's Island. Although the visual of that commercial even to this day disturbs me to no end, my memories of playing Yoshi's Island are some of the fondest of my childhood. Released in 1995, around the same time I originally got my Super NES, Yoshi's Island was a huge departure from its predecessor, Super Mario World. One night, a stork carrying two twins is ambushed by an evil Magikoopa, Kamiik, who nabs both the stork and one of the bundles it is carrying, the other falling to the earth. Soon the scene changes to Yoshi's Island, where several Yoshis in a variety of colors discover the other bundle, containing baby Mario, and they decide to embark on a journey to reunite him with his twin, Luigi. Yoshi's Island is an absolutely charming platformer, 
that has one of the most unique art styles on the Super Nintendo. Its bright, vibrant colors, 3D effects, and bouncy, catchy music make it stand out amongst other games of the time, and the gameplay is both accessible and surprisingly challenging at times. Visually, this has to be one of my absolute favorite games for the Super NES, and I love this sort of colored-in art style that perfectly suits the tone of the game. It's a game that's easy to go back to, and very addictive, and all the collectibles in each level give it a high replayability factor. Yoshi's Island is a must-have for any fan of the Super NES, or platformers in general. Plus Yoshi! Yoshi Yoshi! <laughs> it's absolutely excellent. <laughs> uh. The last Metroid is in captivity. The galaxy is at peace. Number 6, Super Metroid. Dark, foreboding, isolating, and even downright creepy sometimes, 1994 Super Metroid captures an atmosphere like no other game. An almost reimagining of the first Metroid, it vastly expands and improves upon the formula of its NES predecessor by adding more abilities, items, upgrades, and a much needed map. Super Metroid is the game that defined the Metroidvania genre and was the first of its kind to implement many of the standards of modern-day Metroidvanias. The plot focuses on Samus, who, after delivering the Metroid hatchling that she originally encountered in Metroid 2, receives a distress signal from Ceres Station shortly after her departure. She goes back to find the entire crew dead and encounters Ridley, who has captured the Metroid hatchling for himself. Soon, a self-destruct sequence is activated on the station, and Ridley flees to planet Zebus where Samus follows him, and the main game takes place. Along the way, Samus encounters several other space pirates such as Kraid, Fantoon, and Crocomire, and navigates through long foreboding tunnels in vast underground areas. These elaborate passageways makes exploration the cornerstone of Super Metroid's gameplay. The world feels huge, and the ability to accidentally find a new passage, hidden item, or even sequence break makes the gameplay supremely satisfying. It makes the player feel not just immersed in this lonely, isolated world, but in control of it. Super Metroid's tone and atmosphere is brought to life by the absolutely stellar dark, eerie, and early science fiction-y sounding soundtrack. It's creepy yet gorgeous visuals and satisfying gameplay. This makes it truly stand out amongst other games, and makes it one of the greatest games of all time, as well as the best Metroid game of the series. Number 5, Super Mario All-Stars. Jam-packed with everything a Mario fan could ever want up until that point, 1993 Super Mario All-Stars is four classic Mario games in one. For me personally, this was the game that got me into video gaming in the first place, and introduced me to this wonderful series. All three original Super Mario Bros. games for the NES are featured, including the Japan-only version of Super Mario Bros. 2, dubbed The Lost Levels. Each game receives a graphics upgrade, as well as a fresh new soundtrack which I think far surpasses the original games. The mechanics of each game are intact, however, although slightly tweaked, and each game feels like the original counterparts, only with a fresh new coat of paint. Or Mario paint. <laughs> okay, okay, I'll stop, sorry. Seriously though, all the games feel more polished and like a fresh but familiar experience. For me personally, this was my first exposure to these games, and going back to the original NES versions of these games is kinda tough after being raised on the Super Mario All-Stars version. The colors are more vibrant, the graphics more crisp and layered. The music and sound effects are much more polished and satisfying, and in a strange way, make the game feel more immersive. Maybe it's just my nostalgia talking, but I absolutely love this game, and to me these will always be the definitive versions of the first three Super Mario Bros. games. This compilation is an absolute must-have for the Super NES, and if you want an even more complete package, Super Mario All-Stars and Super Mario World is an even better deal. Number 4, Super Mario World. Speaking of Super Mario World, how could I possibly leave out what is in my mind the greatest platformer of all time? Super Mario World was originally released in 1991 as a launch title for the Super Nintendo. Featuring over 70 levels in 9 different worlds, Super Mario World was at the time the biggest Mario game to date. The plot is fairly simple. Mario and Luigi must traverse through Dinosaur Land to save Princess Toadstool from Bowser's clutches. Pretty par for the course, but this game also introduced everyone's favorite dinosaur buddy, Yoshi, for the first time. The ability to ride Yoshi and have him swallow enemies, as well as utilize a variety of different abilities based on what Koopa shells he eats, brought a new, exciting aspect to the game, and Yoshi's character has spawned an entirely different Nintendo franchise of its own. 
The visuals in Super Mario World were a huge upgrade from the original three games for the NES. In all of their colorful glory, Super Mario World's graphics redefined what a Mario game could look like, and the music and sound are both catchy and satisfying. Super Mario World's great strength, however, is in its gameplay. The game incorporates many aspects of the previous three games. Mario can run, jump, grab items like Koopa shells, and even utilize a new spin jump that allows him to jump off of spiky enemies, as well as break certain blocks. The original items, the mushroom and the fire flower, are present, but it's really the feather, giving Mario the ability to fly and flutter endlessly through the level, that is the most exciting new addition. Each of the levels are very unique, and at times very challenging even to some of us veteran players. The game has a plethora of secrets, from secret switches that activate blocks, keys to secret levels, and even two secret worlds that feature some of the toughest and most unique levels in the game. For me personally, Super Mario World in many ways was the game of my childhood. I have played it at least 20 or 30 times through, and still find it exciting to pick up and play. It's a timeless classic, and in my mind the greatest Mario adventure game of all time. Number 3, Earthbound. Quirky, odd, funny, emotional, dark, and even disturbing at times. Earthbound is all of these things and more. Released originally in 1995 as the brainchild of famous Japanese writer Shigazato Itoi, Earthbound, and the Mother series as a whole, is perhaps one of the most underrated and bizarre experiences in gaming. The game stars Ness, a 13-year-old boy living in Onnit, a small town not dissimilar to suburban America, who is awoken one night after a meteorite crash lands near his home. After going out to investigate it with his obnoxious neighbor Pokey, he discovers an alien bee from the future who explains to him that the future of the Earth is devastated by an evil entity known as Gygas. The legend from this time speaks of four young heroes who stop Gygas, whom the alien presumes Ness is one of. After the bee is swatted by Pokey's mom, Ness embarks on a journey across Eagle Land to find eight sanctuary locations, record the melodies from them in a soundstone, and unite with his three companions, Paula, Jeff, and Pooh, to defeat Gygas. If this doesn't sound strange enough already, along the way you encounter a cult obsessed with painting the world blue, a zombie-infested town, a band that keeps getting screwed by the theaters they play in, talking rocks, evil trash cans, cups of coffee and traffic signs, a race of weird, uh, Mr. Nose people, a giant pile of puke, and dinosaurs. While all of this may sound very strange, it's all part of one cohesive plot and surprisingly strong and at times touching story. Earthbound is very much a game about growing up, and its charming design, extremely well-written dialogue, and unique battle system makes it truly stand out amongst other RPGs at the time. Although a commercial failure when it was initially released in the West, the game and series slowly garnered a large, vocal following which, coupled with Ness's inclusion in Smash Bros, really shed light on just how great this game really is. Earthbound may be the weirdest and quirkiest game to ever be released, and I personally adore it. Number 2, Chrono Trigger. It's about time, literally. Chrono Trigger was originally released in 1995 by Squaresoft. Conceived initially by Hironobu Sakaguchi, creator of Final Fantasy, Yuji Horii, creator of Dragon Quest, and artist Akira Toriyama of Dragon Ball fame, later dubbed the Dream Team, Chrono Trigger was the team's attempt to, quote, create something that no one had ever done before, and that they did. With Chrono Trigger, Squaresoft turned the traditional JRPG formula on its head, expanding upon the turn-based battle system that was the standard for JRPGs at the time. Chrono Trigger's battle system was unique in that enemies were encountered on the field immediately, and did not just pop up randomly. It also featured an active time battle system, allowing characters to attack once their speed stat has reached zero. Furthermore, each character has specific tech moves based upon their magic and physical abilities. These abilities can be paired with another character's tech to form a more powerful double tech or even triple tech move, based upon what combination of characters you have in the party. This unique blend made Chrono Trigger's battle system very engaging, accessible, and yet still challenging. And for me, executing powerful tech moves still feels immensely satisfying, and trying various different combination of tech moves is still endlessly entertaining over 20 years later. Chrono Trigger's greatest strength, however, is in its absolutely fantastic and unique story. Chrono Trigger is a story about time travel. The story stars Chrono, a red-haired silent protagonist who looks strangely similar to Goku. Hmm. Weird. I wonder why. <laughs> anyway, he attends the Millennial Fair, only to bump into a strange girl named Marley, knocking her pendant off of her. After Chrono recovers it for her, she tags along with him. They run into Chrono's inventor friend Luca, who has a new teleportation device she is showing off. Marley enthusiastically volunteers to be teleported, but the device reacts strangely to her pendant and she vanishes. Stunned, 
Chrono hops on the teleporter, grabbing her pendant, and is sent through a time warp to the past, where the real adventure begins. Eventually, Chrono, Marley, and Luca travel to the future, where the world is desolate and ruined. They discover that the planet had been devastated by an evil entity known as Lavos in the year 1999 AD, and decide to traverse through time in order to stop Lavos and save the world. Along the way, they meet up with a colorful cast of characters, including Robo, Frog, Ayla, and Magus, who all join the party. The party travels all throughout time, from the Middle Ages to the future, the prehistoric past, and even the end of time. Chrono Trigger's lush visuals, unique art style, varied and immersive world, an absolutely phenomenal soundtrack composed by Yasunori Mitsuda and Nobu Matsu, my personal favorite game soundtrack of all time by the way, sets off the tone, emotion, and plot of the game perfectly well. Chrono Trigger was a landmark achievement in not just the realm of RPGs, but in gaming as a whole, and is often cited as one of the greatest games of all time. To me, I absolutely adore this game. However, it takes second place behind only one other game on the Super NES. Have you heard about that Mario guy? Number 1, Super Mario RPG, Legend of the Seven Stars. Of any game on the Super Nintendo's rich library, Super Mario RPG Legend of the Seven Stars has been, and shall always be, my number one pick. While to some this may be a bit of an oddball choice, I think that for me it is because the game combines all of my favorite elements from video games of that era, as well as being a collaboration from two of my favorite developers on the Super Nintendo. Released in 1996, late into the Super NES's life cycle, Super Mario RPG Legend of the Seven Stars was developed as a collaboration between Nintendo and Squaresoft in an attempt to bring RPGs to a more mainstream audience. While RPGs sold very well in Japan at the time, sales had been relatively modest overseas. Mario was an obvious choice to bring more attention to the genre, and legendary Mario creator Shigeru Miyamoto had also shown interest in developing an RPG starring Mario. Super Mario RPG is, to me, a perfect blend of the platforming style of the Mario games mixed with the turn-based battle system of traditional RPGs. The game is very unique, however, in that it incorporates a timed hits mechanic, allowing the player to do more damage or take less damage based on how well timed they hit the button on the controller. This would later become a staple of future Mario RPG games. The game also features a lot of platforming as you would naturally expect from a Mario game, but on an isometric 3D plane, which is totally unique and new for a Mario game at the time. Super Mario RPG's graphics, sound, and music were some of the best of the Super Nintendo era. The game features pre-rendered 3D graphics, making full use of the Super Nintendo's SA1 chip. The music, composed by Yoko Shimamura, is some of the best on the Super NES, and features some reimagined versions of classic Mario and Final Fantasy tracks, as well as an original and catchy music that fits perfectly with the atmosphere of the game. To many, Super Mario RPG is one of the most important Mario games, as it was really the first to flesh out the Mario universe in a much deeper and richer way than it had ever been before. Characters like Peach, Bowser, Toad, and Yoshi are given some real personality to them, and the game features a slew of original characters as well that add to the charm of the world. Particularly, the two new playable characters, the lovable but clumsy Cloud Mallow and the mysterious wizard-like possessed doll Geno, remain fan favorites to this day. Super Mario RPG's story was unique and had a tone to it much different than any other Mario game. This is perhaps due to Square's heavy input on the story, giving the game a bit more of a serious tone at times, but still balancing it well with the lighthearted humor of the Mario universe. The game follows Mario, Peach, Bowser, Mallow, and Geno as they seek the seven pieces of the Star Road that a giant sword, Exor, has destroyed upon landing on Bowser's Keep. Along the way, it is revealed by Geno that this Star Road, where he hails from, has been destroyed by the Smithy Gang, making it impossible for wishes to be granted. Along the way, our heroes encounter many of Smithy's underlings and adventure throughout a rich and colorful world on their quest to recover the Seven Stars. Super Mario RPG's truly engaging and original story, lovable characters, colorful visuals, fun gameplay, and absolutely stellar soundtrack really gripped me as a kid. Super Mario RPG was my first RPG, and remains today not just my favorite Super NES game, but my favorite video game of all time. I want to thank everyone for watching this video. I have a ton of other content on my channel, including streams, reviews, video analyses, and even let's plays of a lot of the games featured on this list, like these. 
I hope you'll check out more of my content, as well as other content like this in the future. My next video planned is a top 10 list of classic rare rare titles, which I hope you'll look forward to. I'd also really appreciate a like and hope you'll consider subscribing to my channel as well. Thank you again. Peace.